Thanks, worship team. You can be seated. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Midterms going all right? Yeah. As everyone's getting seated, I, I just need our elite workout crew from last night, my, my workout team, just to join me up here for a minute. We just had a, the holy remnant last night. Come on. Here we are. There we go. Well, we, well we, got, we, we posted the picture on Instagram, you know, of, of, the, uh, of the guys here. Yeah, so, so can I tell you what you missed last night? Now, some of you were watching a basketball game. That was good. That was, that was legit. And uh, did your team win? All right. Victory there. What was that? Yeah, yeah, you tore it up, right? Is it true that he was the star? 20 rebounds. Come on. Impressive. Yeah, so we did, our, we, we did our workout. It's broken down, but it was, in the end of the day, it was 420 jumping jacks, 210 push-ups, 210 squats, and 210 crunches. Sweet. And they almost kept up, so they're getting there. They're getting there. No, hang on. Okay. So which of you guys, uh, how, how many of you have been with me for every workout so far? Three out of three? Oh, all right, three out of three. Okay, I was told that there's one light if you stand under it and flex that your muscles actually look bigger. So who, who actually has that on your phone? Who has the flex pictures? Oh, someone else took them? Oh, someone else took it. So whoever took it, you get the official picture over to Katie. Joseph? Okay, so get, get it over to Katie so we'll, we'll have reference to that, all right? Because I, it, it makes you look like you actually have muscles. I mean, these guys do. But anyway, no, these guys do. That's what I'm saying. It made me look like, but these guys have. So anyway, just a hand for our team here. Come on. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. It's a joy to hang out, push together, spend some. And who was the one guy that was pumping the 100-pound dumbbells? Oh, Joseph also. Okay. All right. You got to 100? Are you serious? Come on. Very impressive. All right. Um, there's rumor, I can't confirm it, but there is rumor that there might be a guest drummer during worship at 11 tomorrow. It's just rumor. But we'll, we'll see. If you see an old guy up there, it'll probably be, be me. Okay. Last thing, uh, any of the folks that actually use their cell phone and you're looking at it for translation, just, just wave at me so, so I'm aware. Okay. Right there in the front row, using it for translation. Okay, that's good. All right, so this way, all right, so if you're using it for translation, I won't think, oh, to take notes. Okay, so how many of you use your cell phone to take notes? How many use it for a translation? How many use it because you're bored by the teachers? Ah, uh, ah. Uh. All right. Yeah, so I'm so sorry if, if I've at any point thought that, that you were just watching something else with real focus when you're actually listening to your translation. So appreciate that. All right, let's, let's pray. Abba, we love you, and we ask you for a holy insight for life-changing insight. Speak to us in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I was asked after the class yesterday for a list of verses that I had gone through because I had I'd just gone through things out of my head and didn't have anything printed out. I said I'd bring some for a student today, but I'll actually get them to Katie so you can all have the list of different verses that we covered yesterday, all right? So uh, just make it easier that way. One verse I didn't talk about I just want to start here, and then we're going to switch subjects completely to the next question on your list, which is how can you discover your spiritual calling? How can you really know what God's called you to? So we're going to be super practical today after being more doctrinal yesterday. But a verse I, I failed to mention yesterday, but it comes up all the time. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. So my newest book uh, just released today 
why have so many Christians left the faith? And you'll see people respond to the book saying, but they weren't true Christians. If they left the faith, they weren't true Christians because true Christians will never really leave the faith. So when somebody leaves, that's the proof they weren't really a Christian. And the verse that's always used for that is 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they had have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. So many people believe that this verse teaches if somebody leaves and they stay away, they were never really part of the body. And that's how you know they were never really part of the body because they left. If they were truly part of the body, they would never leave. So obviously, many of the verses we talked about yesterday that warn us about the dangers of leaving, that warn us about falling away, they would have no, no relevance if nobody can ever really fall away. So it makes me question if that's what this verse is really saying. The one thing it's saying is that there are certain people who left, and if they're really with us, they would have stayed. The fact they left meant they really weren't with us. In other words, it's not anybody who ever leaves, but these particular people. But when it says they, who's the they? Who, who is it talking about when it says they? Well, go back one previous verse. Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us, for had they belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but their going showed that none of them belonged to us. In other words, these people who are now denying the faith and hostile to the gospel, they used to be part of us. But obviously, they're not really part of us. They never were really part of us. And the proof is, look at where they are today. It's not saying that any Christian that ever falls away was not truly saved. It's not saying that at all. It's talking about particular people, these antichrist people, these people opposing the gospel, denying the gospel, they used to be part of us, but you see where they are now. Obviously, they were never really part of us. And we've all seen that. You know, maybe a teammate in sports or a schoolmate or someone with work is like, ah, they were never really with us. Now that they've left, you can see they were never really with us. But it's not saying that anyone who ever falls away was never with us. It's not what the verse is saying. All right, so let's switch subjects completely and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. You're in ministry school. That means on some level you feel a calling from God on your life to serve him in a specific way. You don't just want to sit in the back and do nothing. You want your life to count. You want God to use you. Some of you have a very clear vision already that, that God's shown you what he wants you to do. Others, you have a strong sense. Others, you really don't know. In, in our ministry school, began as Brown's Rural Bible School of Ministry and then continued as Fire School of Ministry over a 22-year period. And then we, when it got very small, we just put all the classes online. But our school birthed a missions movement. And every year, we have a missions conference in October. So we would, we would have our missions conference and missionaries that had been out all around the world would come back and, and still do come back every year, share testimony. We help raise funds for them, et cetera. And I would tell the first-year students that during missions week, they're going to be called to like six or seven different countries. Because, you know, you have our missionary, one of our missionaries from, from China up there speaking, and it's like you're overwhelmed. It's like China. I know I'm called to China. I, I always felt something special about China. And then the next thing, it's, you know, missionary to India. It's like, oh, it, I've got to go India. <laughs> and I tell them over the course of the week, you're going to get six different callings. So sometimes over the course of your life, you'll feel a tremendous burden. I've got to give my life to fight abortion. This is it. I know it. And then two days later, it's like human trafficking. That's, I got it. And then the next day, it's church planting. It's all about church planting. And then the next, it's, everything comes out of the prayer. I'm, I'm called to lead a house of prayer. And you go through all kinds of different callings. It's, that's normal and natural. Okay? You know, for decades preaching, when I, when I first started in 73, I, I preached without notes and spontaneously. In other words, God would just drop a message in my heart. Sometimes I've had, I've had it weeks in advance and would have notes and everything. But the pattern normally was I would get up to speak without notes. And many times, to this day, 
I, I go to a service and I still have no idea what I'm going to speak until I get up to preach. You know, sometimes literally I'll stand up and say, let's pray, and I, I don't know what I'm supposed to speak on yet. And normally, in a case like that, with each song that's being sung, I get a different message. We're singing some beautiful message about the beauty of Jesus or something like that. And as we're singing about the beauty of Jesus, like, that's it. I'm just going to preach on Jesus. And then the next thing, it's a holiness song. It's like, yes, holiness is the message. And I'll pass through like four or five different messages in the course of the meeting. So you may pass through all kinds of phases where you know this is it. This is my calling. This, and, and it may be beautiful and powerful, but it's really not it. It's not the, the thing that you're called to long term. And what you're called to long term may be, quote, vocational ministry, like pastoring a church or teaching in a ministry school or, or going on the mission field. It, it may be a different aspect of ministry, like teaching in a public school as a godly Christian. It, it may be being raised up as a political leader to bring righteousness to your community. It can come in many, many different ways. How do, how do you know what that real calling is? So in Romans 12, Paul writes this, beginning verse 3. For by the, by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith or the faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So here he's not talking about apostles, prophets, evangelists, different aspects of calling and says, go with the gift God's given you. So how do you really know what your gift is? How do you really know long-term what God is calling you to? So I'm going to make it really simple first and then open it up in some more depth. Ultimately, as you are walking with the Lord consistently over a period of time, so really spending time with him, really being with him, really walking in obedience to him, as you are being with the Lord consistently over a period of time, there will be something that more than anything else, he consistently burdens you with. You're consistently praying about. You're consistently seeing the world through this particular lens. You're, you, you, are, you are gripped in one particular area, and you are graced in that particular area. So, so ultimately, over, again, over a period of, of years of walking with the Lord and spending time with God and being in his presence, there's something that you are regularly gripped with that's important to you, that, that you're praying about, that you're burdened with, and, and you are especially graced in that area, that there's a flow with you, that when you get into this, it just works well. Any of you played different instruments and then really came on your instrument? That happened to any of you? Like, you, you know, you, your parents wanted you to play a certain thing, and you're, you're okay with it, and then you pick up something else, wow, that you can play? Or you find your niche in something else, like, wow, I didn't know I had this. So it's the same thing spiritually, the way it unfolds. Let me, let me just give you an illustration of something. Just in terms of five-fold ministry and different expressions. Let's say I'm, I'm a guest speaker at your, at your church, and no one realized that I didn't have water. And as I'm speaking, <coughs> I cough. So one guy, he's, you know, really, really pastoral, you know, he, he comes, well, some, somebody realized, okay, I need some water, and he comes running to give me this bottle of water. He opens it, right, but he trips and falls, and the water spills out. Well, somebody in the congregation that's really pastoral says, oh, brother, that was so kind of you to do that, and don't worry about the spill. We'll clean it up. Somebody else who's got a real teaching anointing says, brother, I noticed as you were walking that you, were, you took your eye off, and that's why you tripped and spilled the water. Another guy who's much more evangelistic in his calling gets up and says, we are all like spilled water. We are all lost. We, let's have an altar call right now. And then someone else who's more prophetic in his calling says, brother, you need to be more careful. 
And then someone else who's much more apostolic says, we need a system and a method in all of our churches where every pulpit is supplied with this amount of water for every speaker. So every, everybody has their own angle and their own gift, and it's kind of how they see the world. And it's not that one is right, the other is wrong. It's just different gifting, and you have to get used to it. You know, I, I use the example of a pastor who says to his elders, listen, we don't even know each other in this church. We, people have been coming here for years, and they don't even know each other's names, and that's just not right. So look, what we're going to do is the first Sunday of every month, as soon as service is over, we're going to clear out all the chairs. Everyone's going to bring in potluck meals, and we're going to put tables out, and we're all going to sit. And then every month, you sit with people you don't know, and we're going to fellowship and have a good time together. And the evangelist, one of the elders who's an evangelist, says, Pastor, that's immoral. Do you know how many people outside our doors don't even know Jesus? They've never heard the gospel once, and we're going to sit here and feast while they die and go to hell? Pastor, that's immoral. First we go out and knock on doors in the neighborhood, and then we come and have our meal. And then the prophetic elder says, Pastor, there is so much sin in the camp. Do you think God is going to bless our fellowship? We need to repent first. Then when we repent, then we can have fellowship. And the guy who's really gifted as a teacher says, Pastor, could I do a series of, of teachings on the, on the word koinonia in Greek so we could really understand what fellowship is? So everybody sees the world through a certain lens, right? And when you have a particular calling, it could be a calling to mercy, it could be a calling to generosity, it could be a calling to leadership in different ways. When you have a particular grace on your life, then you're going to see the world through that lens. It's, it's just natural to you. And, and then you're going to be burdened to pray in those ways. And then when you do the thing, there's going to be a special grace on it. Now, now, here's the deal. You may not fully function in your calling for years. In other words, there may just be preparation, service. Like you may be called to, to be a, 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 a businessman who supports the gospel going to unreached nations with tens of millions of dollars. But right now, you may be cleaning toilets. That may be a reality. And, and we'll come back to a principle about that, how you work these things out. So many times you know you're calling, but it doesn't get fully released. And, and that's why we just serve, and, we, and there are no superstars. We're here to serve and honor the Lord. And then over a period of time, just like with, with work or anything, over a period of time, as you grow, you get to specialize more. You get to do more and more of what God's really called you to do and the other things others can do because now your time is more valuable. Uh, let me just show you a, a clip. How many of you saw the, the movie years ago, Chariots of Fire? Only a few. Okay, it, it's one of the great movies ever made. Wonderful Christian movie. Whole family could watch it. It, it was uh, award-winning when it came out but a glorious Christian theme based on the life story of Eric Liddell, who ended up dying as a missionary overseas. But here he's in this famous scene, so he's an, he's an Olympic level runner. And he's telling his sister that the missions organization has accepted him to go to China. However, first, before he goes, he's gonna run in the Olympics. So it's, it's the most famous line from the movie but I just want you to see this clip together. Undecided. All right, hang on. We need the, the audio. The missionary service have accepted. Oh, <laughs> oh I'm so pleased. Well, I've got a lot of running to do first. Jenny. Jenny, you've got to understand. I believe that God made me for a purpose for China, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. You were right. It's not just fun. To win is to honor him. All right, so quick little clip, if you missed any of it with the accent, the key line, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. So he ends up you know, winning a gold medal. Dramatic story. It's, it's an incredible movie. Chariots of Fire. 
Uh, and then after that, he goes on the mission field. There is a fundamental truth about that when you are really doing the things God called you to do, that you can say, God made me fast, and when I run, I feel his pleasure. God made me to do this or do this, or, and when I do it, I feel his pleasure in a distinct way. And, and it's, not, it's not hard. It's not a burden. People look at the schedule I keep and the life I lead, and they think, how do you do it? It's, it's what I'm called to do, and there's grace to do it. I look at someone else and say, how do you do it? It's like, well, it's, it's what I'm graced to do. And then there are other things that are just not what you're called to do, and they don't go well. Or it's almost like you're running through knee-deep water. Every, and, and look, it doesn't mean that we don't have tests and trials. We all will. And, and everyone has to sacrifice. And many days you have to do things you really don't want to do just to be disciplined before God, right? That's being a disciple. That's taking up the cross. But I'm talking about ultimate life calling. It's something that you know. It's something that, that to, to give it up, to not do it, would, would take your very soul away because it's what he made you and fashioned you to do. So I just want to share some of my, my own story. You saw the picture of me from when I was starting to get into drugs before I was saved uh, yesterday. So, oh, the old picture there. Okay. Now, I, just leave it up for a second. My wife, Nancy, met me after I was saved two and a half years. She was not saved when we met. So she hadn't seen that old picture of me. So years later, she saw it, and she started laughing. I said, you're laughing because I look like a woman. She said, no, I'm laughing because you look like an ugly woman. Uh, but, see, you know, my, my hair got much longer and all that, and I looked much more degenerate, but I didn't know I was about to get saved and needed a testimony picture. So, but that gives you an idea of where we're going. Okay, we're done with the picture. Thank you. It's, it's going to be used against me for years to come, I think. Okay. Anyway. So when I got saved, I got radically saved and left everything, you know, the whole idea of playing in a rock band and being a rock drummer and this whole bit, just left it all behind, just wanted to be with the Lord. And by the time I was saved a year, I, I was so hungry for the things of God that I would spend at least six or seven hours alone with the Lord every day. And I remember it was, it was days before cell phones and tablets and PCs and cable TV and everything. So I was really undistracted. If I wanted to just focus, I focused. So it was at least three hours in prayer every day, at least three hours in the word every day, going to multiple church services every week, sharing the gospel, at least one new person every day. And I started preaching when I was 18. So 1973, 18 years old, I preached the first time. And there's just this, the message came pouring out of me. And, and I, I mean, I just knew God was with me. When I finished the message, the pastor said, if Mike Brown's not called to preach, nobody's called to preach. It was just clear there was a grace in me. So that's all I want to do. I said, well, I wanted to preach the gospel. That was it. But in our paradigm, in our way of thinking then, basically you had pastor and you had evangelist. We never really talked about apostolic stuff or prophetic stuff. It wasn't even in our mindset. So you're, you're either a pastor, so you're called to just be in one place, or you're, you're called to be an evangelist, which pretty much would mean you travel to other places and you give altar calls and you pray for the sick. That was, that was kind of our paradigm. And even though all of us are called to do the work of an evangelist, right, share the gospel, so we're all called to do that. And especially to my Jewish people, I have an evangelistic calling, but my primary calling is not evangelist. Those of you who have an evangelistic calling, you, 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 you're, you have a single track. You know, Daniel Kalendu with uh, leading uh, Christ for All Nations uh, took over Reinhard Bonnke's ministry and one of, our, one of our grads from Pensacola, you know, he always says that for an evangelist, preaching to an all-saved audience, that's hell. Preaching to an all-lost audience, that's heaven. And, you know, when you go with Steve Hill, who was the, the evangelist that God used in the Brownsville Revival, a dear friend Steve with the Lord now, uh, if, if you asked him to speak at a funeral, if you asked him to speak at a wedding, if you asked him to speak at a banquet, be prepared for a hardcore altar call. Anybody in the building, I don't care if you've been saved 20 years, you're going to get saved again. I mean, he's, he's going for souls. He's going for souls. So when I go to India to minister, we don't do evangelistic meetings. 
I go to India to pour into the believers. I, I go to India to pour in the believers and, and, and deepen them and serve them and help them, and they go do the evangelism. When Steve came to India, the one trip he, he made with me uh, over to India, he was looking for the lost. Where are the lost? And the lost would come to the meetings. So I started traveling as an evangelist, and it just didn't fit. I remember Nancy and I were engaged, and, and she came with me on a trip, and it was a Sunday morning. The church had about 100 people, which for me was, was a big church back then. And I, I preached Sunday morning message, and I gave an altar call like for fresh dedication, and everybody, 100 out of 100, everybody came forward. Wow. And at the end of the service, we were sitting, sitting in my car, and I didn't feel satisfied. I just didn't feel right. Now, it wasn't that 100 people all got saved. They responded to my altar call, but it's just something didn't feel right. And I remember at night, then, of course, an evangelist got to pray for the sick, and I've seen the sick healed, but I don't have a gift of healing. It's not my primary calling. So, you know, prayed for the sick, and this one was supposedly healed of this, and this guy couldn't hear out of one ear, now he could hear. And I remember I got home, and, and Nancy and I were, were talking, and I, I tried to test it. You know, I had the guy cover his ear, and I talked, and could he hear me? And I thought, you could hear with the other ear. My test didn't really prove anything. I don't know if anyone was really healed. And I, I just had this dissatisfaction. At the same time, I'm now in college. Nancy and I got married while I was still in college, had our first child before I graduated from college. But I'm now getting into the academic stuff. And I'm really interested in this. And part of my calling was teaching, right? You know, the preaching thing burned in me, but I also had a teaching calling. And, you know, when I'm here in these day sessions, I'm, I'm more functioning as a teacher. Like Tuesday night, that's more of a, a preaching mode. But I, I had that gift and grace as well. And I really got into the academics. I started taking Hebrew in college so I could answer the rabbis because they would always challenge me about my faith. And then I thought, well, if I'm learning Hebrew, I should learn some of the other related languages. So they had Arabic, so I started taking Arabic. And then when I was doing academic study, if you're going to do serious academic biblical study, you need to read German. So I started learning German. And then I thought, you know, the language of my, that's been spoken by my ancestors for centuries, the traditional Jewish language is called Yiddish. It's very close to German. I should, they had Yiddish, so I started taking Yiddish classes. And then, well, the New Testament's written in Greek, so you obviously need to learn Greek, so I started taking Greek. And then, you know, Latin is a big theological language. I thought I should learn Latin. So at one point, it was a mistake, but at one point I was taking six different languages. Now, it's not a problem if you're really good with languages and you build one on another on another. You just don't want to take them all at the same time on the foundational level. But I had real grace in that and, and, and a gift to learn and, and was really interested in that. And at the same time, I was spending less time in prayer every day with the Lord. I, I, you know, now married, now with a child, now working a job. So I didn't have six or seven hours alone with the Lord every day. I was doing a lot more theological reading than just being in the Word. I'm reading the Word more to learn Hebrew and Greek than to just feed my soul and grow in God. And even though I'm a solid, committed believer, my views are starting to shift. And, and then I saw a couple things in our church that really bothered me. And, you know, a charlatan came through and took advantage of us, and we all believed it was real. So I started getting skeptical. And, and the more I'm studying and the more I'm learning, I'm seeing, boy, these scholars, they're not Pentecostal. They're not charismatic. And, and they have different views. So, so I started to shift. And what happened gradually was I left my first love. So uh, please understand this. I was a committed Christian. I was dedicated. I, I, I taught adult Sunday school. We sw switched over to another church, taught adult Sunday school. And I was now going to New York University and adding more languages, ancient languages, Babylonian, Assyrian, and Ugaritic, and Syriac, and these other things. So just adding it in. And I was doing so well in, in grad school that I was given a complete academic scholarship. After the first year, I didn't pay for any courses. All the way through my PhD, I got a complete academic scholarship. So now, I, okay, now I'm, now I'm in my place. See, this is what I was thinking. I'm called to be a professor. I'm called to be a scholar. I'm called to improve translations of the Bible, teach at a seminary. And I'll, I'll preach a little here and there. 
But that thing wasn't burning in me. It wasn't burning in me because I wasn't really walking close enough to the Lord. And, and one reason that, that I had abandoned some of that earlier sense of calling was because we only had these two slots, pastor and evangelist, and I knew I wasn't called to be a pastor, and, and I really wasn't called to be an evangelist, but teacher, that worked. And also, not spending as much time with the Lord in prayer, not being as intimate, even though we, we lived sacrificially, we took refugees in our home for years. We had strangers come from Southeast Asia from refugee camps and live with us for years. We took in others in America. Just care. So, I mean, we, we were devoted believers. And at NYU, when I was going to school, everyone knew I was a strong believer, and yet I had left my first love. Now, hear this. When I was finishing college, the Spirit spoke to me one day. So this is before I had gone on some of this drift, right? The Spirit spoke to me out of, out of 2 Timothy 4. Preach the word. Preach the word. Boom, it hit me. And I thought, am I going in the wrong direction? Because I'm really feeling more I'm supposed to teach and be a scholar and a professor and, and not do this preaching thing. And then suddenly I saw this calling, traveling around the world, being rejected, being hated like Paul was. I just saw it. And you know what I did? I preached a tremendous sermon at my church called Preach the Word. I took the conviction God gave me and put it on everybody else. And you know, the next time he spoke to me about that was five years later. Five years. And at this point, I'm finishing up my, my, my doctoral work at New York University. I was in the early stages of working on my doctoral thesis. You want to hear what it originally was? No, this was an exciting topic. I know you, how many years you were in the military? 11 years? Okay, you're going to love this topic. Are you ready? By the way, this is New York sarcasm, okay? The topic that I was working on for my doctoral dissertation was abbreviated verbal idioms in the Hebrew Bible, a comparative Semitic approach. That would have changed many lives. That would have rocked people's world. You would have read that over and over. So, I mean, that's the direction I was going. And, and God got hold of me in 1982 and began to bring me through a season of personal repentance. Biggest thing was pride. You know, would I actually say I, I was going the wrong way? And, and that even though God's called me into these things, that they've gotten out of whack in my life? And could it be that I've left my first love? And something very precious that God graced me with, I'm, I'm no longer walking, could it be? So it's, you, it's, it's hard to humble yourself, you know? You built a whole reputation over a certain thing. You've told others they were wrong for years, and now God's convicting me. So it's through 82, a deep process of repentance. And then he showed me he was going to send an outpouring of the Spirit through me to our church that didn't even believe in an outpouring of the Spirit. He showed me a message I was going to preach, and the Holy Spirit was going to fall. We were going to have like a Pentecost in our church. And I was gripped by it. And then September of 82, I went to Madison Square Garden. There was a famous evangelist then, and he was having a meeting in Madison Square Garden. So, I don't know, 19,000, 20,000 people there, and we're singing the, this old worship song, Let's Just Praise the Lord. Remember that? So the old timers here. And I faintly sensed the spirit as we were singing it. And I said to myself, you used to feel this a hundred times more in your early days in the Lord. And, and it was when I would just go to a church service and we'd sing these old little hymns, the joy of the Lord would be all over me. I mean, it was so real to me that when God really got hold of me, I instantly gave up drugs, instantly gave up the needle, on the spot, for good. And, and every time I go to a church service, for, for a few years, this overwhelming flood of joy in the presence of God was glorious. Here, I'm feeling it faintly, singing with 19,000 people, and that's more than I had sensed God's presence in years, and I realized you're in worse shape than you realize. You have, you have fallen from your first love more than you realize. And I remember thinking, okay, what do I do? What do I do? If I just fast, pray, I'll be on fire for a few days, and I'll fall back. So I thought, the only thing to do is to turn in the right direction. If I was praying five minutes in a day, I'll pray 10 the next. 
If, if I didn't pray at all, I'll pray five minutes. I'm just going to every day turn in the right direction. And then the next month, there was supposed to be a concert at, at another place on Long Island, Island Garden, another big place, uh, by Keith Green. Keith Green, some of you know, but he was a great pioneer in Christian music and a tremendous prophetic voice. This stuff still stands out to this day. But he had died in a, in a tragic plane crash at the age of 28 with two of his kids a few months earlier. So instead, this was a memorial concert for, for Keith Green. And I remember his wife, Melody, was there. And just her attitude of just worshiping God in the midst of it, she lost her husband and two kids, right? And she was just, you know, worshiping God in the midst of it. And God was challenging me. And at the end of the night, they had an altar call just for fresh surrender. And I said, Lord, I know you called me to scholarship. But if, if it's become an idol in my life, if it's gotten in the way, I lay it on the altar. And I laid it on the altar, and he, he burned it up and gave it back to me as a tool. So I, I stepped away from everything for like nine months. When I ended up going back to finish my doctorate, I focused on the Hebrew word for healing, which became like a, the key thing that I wrote about. And out of that, laying everything down, what, had be, what was supposed to be a tool had become an idol in my life. So once I laid it down, God gave it back as a tool. So I'm, I'm still teach at seminaries and do scholarly work, but that's, that's not the central calling. That's, that undergirds what I do. So if I'm going to get up and preach the world's simplest message, it's still going to be sound because I've got scholarship behind it. But that's, that's not the central calling that burns in me. And when God started to use me, as the Holy Spirit was poured out in our church, just as God showed me, November 21st of 82, we had a visitation that lasted three months and six days, and then ultimately leaders turned against what God was doing, and we had to move on. And it was shortly after that God called me to teach at CFNI on Long Island, leave everything, quit my job, and go teach there. So that's, that's how that story all connects. But suddenly, I was... I was doing what I was made to do. Suddenly it all came together. And there was an aspect of the prophetic call to wake up the sleeping church as, as part of the calling on my life. And when I functioned like that, everything was right. Every, every, the, the fruit came, the changes came, the repentance came, lives being dramatically shaken. It all fell into place, and I was, there was nothing that didn't feel right. In the days of evangelist Mike Brown, it just it didn't connect. It didn't feel right. Once I understood this prophetic wake-up call, and with that, the call of revival, the call of revivalists, when it fell into place, yes, everything flowed out of it. So, so the point is, if, if you are being squeezed in a particular mold, it's not really who you are, and, and, and you function and you try to serve in it, it, it can lead to lack of, of spiritual fervor. It can lead to frustration. So again, all of us have to serve in ways that we don't want to at certain times, right? You're, you're a youth pastor in a church and you really differ with the way things are done, but God didn't make you the senior pastor. And you know he called you there, so you, you ask some questions, you get answers, no, this is the way we do things, okay, and you serve. Unless it's causing you to sin, you serve, you just take it, okay, I'm going to honor, I'm going to serve as best as I can, but I know this is not long-term where I'm going to be. All of us have to do certain things, again, especially in the earlier years, that we'd really rather not do. So when you, when you graduate from here, you don't graduate as superstars, you graduate as servants, Right? I used to tell the students in, in Brownsville, I said, listen, those of us who are leaders in revival, we are all nobodies, and we are training you to become nobodies. Yeah. So your, your, we're gonna, your mission, we're going to teach you to press the button. That's your mission. Press the button. You don't know when you press the button if it's going to flush the toilet in the basement or start a nuclear war. You just... Press the button. See, you, you, we serve, we're faithful to serve. It's not about ego. I'm too big for, no, no, nobody. The son of God was not too big to be crucified. So none of us are too big to do a particular thing. I'm a graduate of a ministry school, and you want me teaching three-year-olds? 
Yeah, it could be that this pastor sees that God wants you to preach to millions of people and sees that you think too highly of yourself, so in order to get there, you gotta start here. We humble, we always humble ourselves. But, but when you really come in your element and the things God made you to do, it just, you flow in it. It's who you are. So the, the, the prophetic calling on me, the, the calling to wake up the sleeping church, and then the, the, the calling of, of, of sparking revival, this is, this is just what I'm made to do. And as I flowed in those things, everything fell into place. So scholarship, that's part of my life, but it's a tool. It's not the idol of wanting to be this one or that one. And in fact, to this day, God will set things up for me to always humble me when it comes to scholarship. What do I mean? I don't mean that I make mistakes or that I'm not respected, but I'll give you an example. My professor at NYU uh, passed away, I think, last year, Baruch Levine. So when he got to be 65 or 70, those who used to be students of his or colleagues put together an honorary volume where everybody writes a chapter. It's called the Festschrift in German. It's, a, it's an honorary writing. So, you know, some famous professor, they turn 70. So you, you put out a great publication, former students, colleagues, you write an article, right? You, you write a chapter in the book, and this is your way of honoring them. So you're, you know, you're writing in your specialty area, so and so. I got invited to write for this publication. So remember, I'm at this point leading Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. So when the volume actually comes, you flip through the pages. Here's contribution by so-and-so, professor, Harvard University. Someone, you know, professor, and this, you know, prestigious school here, Oxford University. Here's, you know, another one, professor at whatever the school is. And then here's my contribution, Brownsville Revival School of Ministry. And in other words, this is not some academic high place. This is some ministry school that this guy's teaching at. But God would always want me to remember that. You just take up your cross. You're nobody. You take up your cross and follow me. So the scholarship serves what I do, and I still do academic work. But the thing that beats in my heart day and night is that burden, wake up a sleeping church. See the church shaken. See the nation shaken. Be a prophetic voice to America. I, I do these monthly prayer retreats roughly once a month where I just shut myself in for a weekend, so Friday night, then all day Saturday, and Saturday night, Sunday, Sunday night, and just spend the bulk of the time praying. And for years, when I'd be on these prayer retreats, or, or the almost two years that I've been doing them regularly, and for years before that and other prayer times, I'd just be with the Lord and say, Lord, how can I please you? How can I minister to you? How can I bless you? How can I honor you? What's on your heart? How do you want to spend this time together? And the next thing, he has me on my face groaning and wailing in travail for the expansion of our radio show to rock the nation. It's like, Lord, I'm, I'm here for, just for you. And I'm here just to worship you. And I'm here to pray about a thousand other things. But he moved on me over and over and over. I can't tell you how many times I went through my prayer journal over a few years and was shocked to see how many times he moved on me for the same thing. So here I am about to turn 68, and we are about to do this, this massive national expansion bigger than anything we've ever done, but I know that it's his time and well. I know the calling to shake the nation. It burns in me. And, and when I pray, it burns. And again, God made me fast. When I run, I feel his pleasure. There are, there are things it took a while to fully get into, and I had to bounce off certain walls, but, but I, I know that I know what I'm called to do, and I know there's grace to do it, and I know when he turns me loose, things will happen because it's his grace. It's not us. It's his power working through us. A quick illustration and then some, some practical points. Early on in the Brownsville Revival, I had to confront someone, just some wrong attitude, behavior, and it had kind of been public, so I just graciously went over. I knew this person respected me. It was the end of a service, and, and we were about to go lay hands on people. 
every night people would want prayer. We were about to lay hands on people. And I went to confront this brother, and he responded with a really bad attitude, got really kind of nasty towards me. I was shocked, absolutely shocked, because I knew he respected me, but this is like a slap in the face. And just as we're finishing talking, then it's time, Steve Hill and everybody, hey, Mike, time to pray for everybody. So again, we'd lay hands on people until we're ready to drop. But I was, I was churning on the inside. I was angry. Not, I, not angry. I was grieved. I, I, had not, I didn't have a sinful life. I was just grieved. I was like shaking on the inside. How in the world did this guy just talk to me like that? I can't believe it. Mike, come on. We got to go pray for people. So I thought, all right, I'm going to lay hands on people, but nothing's going to happen. Because I was so, again, I wasn't sinning, but I was just so grieved on the inside. So you got a team walking with you because your body's falling everywhere and stuff, and you got to step over people, and they're helping and all this. And So I'm thinking, okay, I'm going to pray for a few people, and nothing's going to happen. And then I'm going to say, hey, guys, I don't know what's going on, but I'm getting out of here. I go to pray for the first person, and it's like God turned the voltage up two or three times. I'm talking about, boom, like an explosion. It happens to the next person and the next person. And I'm shocked, and God said to me, it's not you. It's never been your power. It's my power. It's not your power. Now, again, I wasn't, I wasn't sinning. I, I was, it's not like God was working through me as I was actively sinning. I was just hurt. I was upset. I was surprised. But he was reminding me, it's my gift. It's my gift. So we're not talking about how great you are or how big you are, but how great God's gift is in us. And the things that he's made us to do, it's just... But I've seen people serve sacrificially. I remember when my, when my mom was sick towards the end of her life in the hospital, and these nurses just taking care of her, and I thought, how do you, she's a stranger. I just went over to thank them, and many of them were believers. I just went over to thank them and said, thank you for taking such good care of my mom. And, you know, you're talking about washing her bedpan and all this stuff, and it's a perfect stranger, but that's what they do. And they had a heart to do it. I've watched other people just, it's amazing. That what they can do with finances and how they can see things and give. You ask me to step in their shoes and I collapse instantly. You ask them to step in my shoes, they collapse instantly. So we, we never compare ourselves one with another. But over time, there will be things that you say, this is what he made me to do. This is what he anointed me to do. This is what he graced me to do. And when I do it, I feel his pleasure. And, and think, everything feels right in that setting. And whatever sacrifice you have to go through, whatever opposition, you can take it because it's your calling. Years back, there was one major company that decided to boycott my state where I live now, North Carolina, decided to boycott North Carolina because of the so-called bathroom bill that said that a biological male cannot share a bathroom with a biological female. So I decided we need to push back and we should boycott this company. So I went to just get a website with a certain domain name. Anybody can do that. It takes two seconds, right? I think it was $3 to come up with this domain name. I worked at this thing for weeks and couldn't get it to work. And God was reminding me, that's not your calling. You've got like the American Family Association. They're, they do really well with these things. They call for something. They get millions of people to sign up. That's not your calling. And when I went to do it, it was, it, nothing worked. It's something so simple. It was God reminded me, you let others do that. You just be a voice. You speak. You speak to the issues and call people. And, and it's like David going to fight Goliath, and he puts on Saul's armor. This doesn't work. So let me say again. Many times you have to do things that you really don't want to do. It's not sin. It's not someone asking you to sin. It, it, it may be something that you don't fully agree with, but it's not life and death. And you serve, you do it, you honor. And always remember that you reap what you sow. So as you sow respect and honor for others, you, you'll reap that in years to come. As, as, as you serve those that, that are over you in leadership, an authority, as you serve them with diligence as if serving the Lord, then many years later, you'll have people very loyal to you. Right? You, you want to sow disloyalty, go ahead and be disloyal. But in, in Luke 16, after the, the parable of the unjust steward, 
or the, the parable of the corrupt manager, whatever you want to call it. Jesus gives three principles, three simple principles. One is, if you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much. If you're faithful with little, you'll be faithful with much. Never think, well, this is beneath me. People don't really recognize my calling. God may be testing you. And the little that you're doing may be important also. You never really know. So if you're faithful, that which is little, then you'll be entrusted with more. First principle. So on the way to working out your life calling, you're going to have many of these little things. There's a poem I once read, find out what God would have you do and do that little well for what is great and what is small because only God can tell. So it's like, I'm going to push the button because God told me to push the button. And whatever, the results are in his hands. So faithful and that which is little, faithful and that which is much. Another principle is if you're faithful with something that belongs to somebody else, God will entrust you with something of your own. Somebody lends you your car, you bring it back in a mess, gas tank run down, garbage in the car. You're not trustworthy to have your own. Someone lends you something, you bring it back in the same condition, better condition, you can be trusted with your own. Always think of that when you're serving in somebody else's ministry. This is not mine, this, this belongs to someone else, they've been entrusted with it. But if I'm faithful here, then God one day can trust me with something of my own. And the more I'm independent and try to do my own thing, the less he'll trust me with something of my own. So faithful in little, faithful in much, faithful in that which belongs to somebody else, faithful that which is your own. And then lastly, if you're faithful with material riches, God will entrust you with spiritual riches. If you're faithful with material riches, God will entrust you with spiritual riches. I'm not a money person. That's not my strength. I'll, I'll jump too quickly to do a ministry thing or give too freely or pay someone too generously or not be wise in a certain ways. So with our ministry, I don't make any financial decisions of any consequence. That's trusted to others that run it, and they're trustworthy and anointed. But I'm still faithful in terms of if, if something's given me, I'm going to be faithful with it. So faithful with material riches, God will entrust you with spiritual riches. So along the way to the working out of your calling, you may know it now. God may have spoken to you about it. It may have been confirmed prophetically 10 times, but it may be 20 or 30 years before it fully works out. But every day counts. Every day you can make a difference. Every day you can be more like Jesus. And even when you're misunderstood, when other people get credit for what you do, when people don't really recognize the gift in you, it's a great opportunity to humble yourself and become more like Jesus. Take up the cross, let God fight for you. And I've seen it for decades and decades. He knows how to raise you up. He knows how to open doors. He knows how to give you prominence. He knows how to get the message out. Humble yourself in the sight of God and often in the sight of man. He will lift you up. And he will do it faithfully. Amen? So tomorrow, uh, you can ask me questions on any, anything we've talked about or any other subject you want. The only rule is, because there are more students than we have time for questions, if you asked a question last time, you don't get to ask a question the next month. Just like with radio, we don't let people call within a certain period of time, all right? So tomorrow, any question on any subject, either what we covered today, yesterday, or anything else. And with that, God bless. We'll see you tomorrow.